then let's go ahead and let's jump into this Samurai Jack Season 5, Episodes 1 through 3 review. So, uh, Hikari, if you would, kick us off on, I guess, a brief synopsis of pretty much what it is we're getting ourselves into going into Season 5. Wow. Samurai Jack, man. Um... The first thing I, I want to say is that thematically, there's been a shift. Um, it's not as light as it used to be. No, it's not. No, it's not. So it's it's much more emotionally and psychologically intense. Um, I, I kind of knew this going in, but I wasn't quite prepared for for the. I, I don't want to say it's dark. Because it's, it's not quite dark, but it, it, it has gravity to it. That's that's the word. It, ha it has an emotional weight and gravity to it. And so um, 50 years have passed since we last saw Samurai Jack. And now um, he's on his, his lone wolf campaign, uh, just trying to eke out a living any way he can by fighting a coup any way he can. And now he's going up against uh, the daughters of Aku who are no longer robots that he's fighting. He's fighting actual live people now. And those fights has to have some real serious consequences. So that's, that's pretty much what's going on now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that is as brief as a synopsis as we can give uh, pretty much because like I say, once again, you know, those first three episodes, so it's really do kind of play out as like one, like uh, like a series premiere, if you will, like one continuous episode, because in that first episode, we pretty much get like the status quo for this season. So in that first episode, we find out, OK, what has happened since we last saw Jack. Right. And then that, that episode even ends with what we were accustomed to seeing with Jack, with him going up against another one of Aku's henchmen, who's a robot and what not at that same time we're getting the origin story for the daughters of aku and then by the end of episode they're getting ready to move on jack jack is moving on without his life i mean uh, with his life and the episodes two and three those last two episodes that we saw was just those so the the first encounter and then the second encounter with the daughters of aku and that sort of continuous battle that took place between them but uh but i do want to touch on a couple of things that you said yeah i was really a hesitant towards this season when I found out, you know, oh, now that it's, you know, it's going to be on Adult Swim and yeah, they're pushing for more mature content. I'm not going to lie to you. I thought that that was pretty much going to come down as it was going to be more gratuitous. It was going to be more violent, maybe even tad bit vulgar, like we were going to, you know, start getting profanity and this, this, that, and the other. I'm not going to lie. And I should have, you know, I should have given the creator the benefit of the doubt because he finally, I mean, when you when you look into the backstory of what was going on, uh, and if you know any of what's been going on with Samurai Jack since its initial cancellation, how the creator has been trying for years to get right. Samurai Jack back on television. For a while, there was talk of uh, Jack coming back in, as a, fi a feature film. And, you know, so finally, uh, enough interest uh, and enough demand has, you know, grown for the for um, Cartoon Network to pretty much give the creator the green light to go ahead and finally finish out the series with one final season. So we know that this is a story the creator's been wanting to tell for some time. And I will say this. I should have given him more credit because when I, when I finally saw the episode and I saw what we were really dealing with, it is more mature and it is more violent. Let's be real about this. It is more violent, but it is mature in the sense that the, like you said, the subject matter that we're dealing, not dealing with now um, is, is it's, it's not for kids. It, you know, we are dealing with Jack has become a war torn warrior right. in in one in in one of the best illustrated uh sense of that term i mean and, and and you know what's funny about that just with what we've seen with jack what some of the things he's been going through in these first three episodes this is probably the i i would say this would you agree this is probably the most samurai we have actually seen jack behave in the manner in which of how he's thinking in the manner in which of how he's acting and then in that last let's, let's be real about this 
episode three, and we'll get into some more detail with this later on, but episode three, that was the most Bushido thing Jack has ever done. Right. That's true. That's true. I didn't think about that, but now that you mention it, that that's that's actually true. Um, this idea of the Bushido way of um, of the fight being spiritual, mm -hmm. um, of it of the fight being um, a reflection of your your moral integrity, of your moral identity. Also, of course, of your psychological identity as well. But now that you mention it, yeah, this this idea of the Bushido way. Uh, what's interesting, though, is how they've 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 managed to complicate this uh, through his relationship with the wolf. Um, yeah. So you get this um, sort of metaphorical projection of Jack in the form of an animal, and and how he's. In one sense, he is alone in the sense that he has to fight Aku alone. But in the other sense, he's not alone because the wolf is right there with him. Um, and so you you get this um, this uh, how do you call it this 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 duality to Jack. Um, you get him in his human form, and you get him in his in his in in a metaphorical animal form as well. And I talked about that in my episode review. So so yeah, I would say that this is this is the most samurai that we've seen samurai jack. And I, and I think it fits. Yeah, it, it it does. Um it does. If if nothing else. So so I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to segue more specifically to a discussion just about episode 1. Um and the one thing I want to talk about mainly because I mean because like I said, episode 1 we're on one hand, we're seeing the origin of the daughters of Aku, which I'll get to in a sec. But uh, and then on the other hand, it's it's Jack. We're introduced to him fifty years later. He hasn't aged. He no longer has the sword, and so you know he's still continuing his crusade against Aku. He runs up against one of Aku's uh, robotic henchmen, who I actually I and you know what I like around briefly i do like how much of a character that henchman was and i'm like okay yeah this, yeah. <laughs> this, this, is, this is more along the lines of what we originally you know is a uh, are accustomed to with samurai jack because you know these these uh iconic sort of uh villain of the weeks you know villain right. of the week if you will if you will but uh but the one thing i do want to touch upon my fir the first specific thing i want to talk about in terms of issue one is that not only do we find out you know what has happened since we last saw jack but we and, and and we don't know entirely what has happened but we just know enough that you know okay this is where jack is at this point in time in the story but the one thing i want to note uh want to touch on is some of the issues that jack is dealing with and the biggest one is that jack is sort of at a spiritual loss and the reason for that is because like Jack has become haunted by the memory of his father and the memory of his people. And it's because 50 years have passed by now and he still hasn't been able to defeat Aku. He still hasn't been able to return to the past and to liberate his people. Because remember Jack's backstory. Right. Jack's land, which is pretty much Japan, okay? because jack is the the son of uh the emperor so pretty much the people of japan they have been in slavery throughout throughout the second half of jack's life pretty much the rest of his adolescence and and into his early adulthood so because remember in that first episode um jack is still a boy when aku awakens and takes over japan he has to leave home and then when he comes back his right. people have been enslaved and he has to liberate them then all right consider this 50 years let's assume that time that let's let's assume that the time stream works in real time right so that means jack's been gone for 50 years which means 50 years have has happened in the past now right jack's father is probably dead jack's mother is probably dead Right, and they and they never saw that liberation from him because he's never been able to make it back. So Jack is haunted by that now, and and it's really it's really um it's really weighing on him and it's paying a toll on him um both mentally and spiritually because like 
I mean, I'm trying to keep it just focused on episode one, but like we see in later episodes, well, no, it's in episode one when his father, the ghost of his father says, you forgot in your purpose. Right. Almost as if like, what have you been doing all this time? Like you forgot what you were, why you were in the future in the first place. You know, um, and I can't, and I, I'm going to be real. Once again, let's tie it back to something that is very samurai and a very Bushido concept. Jack doesn't have a sword anymore. The sword in samurai culture and in history and mythology is supposed to symbolize the soul of the warrior. We are seeing that play out very right. much in this story because without that sword, what else is Jack? And I think what we'll continue to see throughout this season is Jack sort of discovering who he really is without having that weapon. Um, I, I think that's true. Um, but here's the thing for me, and here, here's the here's the thing that I talked about when I talked about the sword. The the sword, of course, is is supposed to be a representation of his soul, supposed to be symbolic of his soul. But it's also a symbol of, of his moral integrity. And it's also a symbol of his moral fortitude and of his hope. Because remember, that sword isn't just a normal sword. It was forged no, by God. Right. Yeah. It, it, was, it was forged by the gods, given to him as if, you know, it was Thor's hammer. Like you are worthy of this sword that 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 your moral integrity and your moral purpose is commensurate with wielding that sword and so when he lost that he didn't just of course lose a piece of his soul uh but he lost some of his moral fortitude and i think that's that's the biggest hit for for samurai jack is the it's not just that he's being haunted by the fact that he never went back to the past and he never liberated his people of course, that's that's one component. But the biggest component for him is the guilt that he feels over his failure. And that and the way that guilt has turned into a sort of moral shame for him. I think that's the biggest thing. And I think that's the impetus that's driving his mental illness in a way. I mean, because mm -hmm. he's I mean, basically he has PTSD. I mean, that's essentially what he has. Um, he has PTSD driven by his moral shame over his moral failures. Yeah. So, yeah. And, 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 dude, and, and that's the, and I mean, even, even the way Jack is operating, I mean, dude, it's, it's really interesting to see, uh, but think about it, the way Jack, you know, the way he's feeling, you know, the way, you know, what he's thinking, the way he's behaving, consider this, he is sounding <clears throat> very much like a, 60, 70 something year old warrior, except he's stuck in the body of a young man because he still right. has his youth. But mentally, right. he is a like 70 year old warrior who's been doing this his entire life. Right. So uh, now on the opposite end of that, I want to bring up the daughters of Aku because what's interesting about this, and I don't know why I didn't expect this, but it makes total sense. Now, the daughters of Aku, they're real interesting because they are, I mean, let's be honest, they're, they're pretty much ninjas for all intent and purpose. But right. consider this too. They are born, bred, raised, and trained to be the, kill, the living killing tools of Aku, living weapons of Aku. But consider this too. We have now gone to a time in which not only is Aku ruler of the universe, but now he has even become a deity somewhat in his own right, right. because the daughters of Aku are a cult. Exactly. They're As I just, said, yeah, I said the same thing. Like they're, they're this is some sort of weird occult shit going on. Yeah, they they are a cult and they are like serving Aku as if he is a god. And what's funny about that is consider this. Despite how far into the future Jack has gone, have we ever seen Jack go up against any adversaries that illustrate that they grew up in the age of Aku, in the time of Aku? Has that ever been illustrated as well as it has been with the daughters of Aku? 
No, I don't think so. I can't remember any off the it's, top of my it, head. Because it seems like in the original, you know, in the first four seasons, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, sh sh you know, certainly Aku has all of these disciples and, he, you know, he has, you know, aliens that he has treaties with, you know, former slaves that he's conquered that does his bidding, you know, assassins and hitmen and all this type of jazz. But all of those characters had to have grown up with Aku as, you know, the uh, the Shogun of Sorrow. You know, he's been the top dog throughout their entire life, but we've never seen an antagonist who have, like, grown up with this sense that, oh, of, of course Aku is the, right. the end all, all, the alpha, the omega. Of, yeah, of course. Like, you don't pray to Aku? What? I know, I know. You you know what this reminds me of? It would be like uh, being born and raised in North Korea, <laughs> right? right? Where where you think <laughs> like Kim Jong Un is like some deity or something? Right, right, yeah. But uh, but it's crazy because I'm I'm I'm, cur I'm curious from a narrative standpoint. Why is it that now we are being introduced? to these sort of characters. And, and, and let, me, let me specify what I mean. So as we mentioned before, we know that the main reason why we didn't really get characters like this in the original series was because it was a kid's show. And let's face it, there is, because this is one of the things the creator even talked about when, uh, when, uh, when he did an interview after that first trailer came out, when you, oh no, actually it was the first screenshot where you saw blood on Jack. And he was like, you know, yeah, now Jack's not, you know, slicing through robots where oil is being splattered over him no now like that is real blood living blood so i understand from a creative standpoint from a conceptual standpoint why we haven't been getting these uh you know living adversaries for jack to cut down before now and let's be real about this that is such a huge huge like that's a shocking that's shocking imagery episode three is a shocking episode especially if you grew up with this series okay because right. let's face it when this, this show first aired in what 2001 right 16 years ago okay for the majority of us we were either adolescents or in the tween phase yeah, or for like some 10. of my old or for, or for some of my older viewers you might have been you know teenagers i i was 12 when samurai jack first came out all right so the thing is it's like having that series mature to that i mean you can't help, look, we sat here and we talked about how some of Jack's hope and, you know, some of, you know, his purpose and stuff like that has been lost by the time we get to season five. Dude, let's be real about this. Some of our innocence went out the window <laughs> with the end of episode two. It was like, whoa, Jack just decapitated that chick and that wasn't a robot. And for him to see that, and how it like, whoa, that was a living thing. So my, my question to you is, Hikari, what do you, we have, we have yet to get a narrative explanation for why now, okay? We know what the creative, the conceptual reason is. What do you think the, nar the, the narrative, the story itself would dictate, oh, Jack hasn't run across something like this before until now. What, what, why do you think that might potentially be? I think the reason is because there are different forms of power. So one form of power is the direct application of force, right? You subjugate somebody, you enslave them, you beat them up, you kill them, you do what you want with them physically. But there are other forms of, of social power as well. And one form of social power is through culture. And one of the most powerful forces of culture is religion. And so when we think about what it means to grow up in a world of Aku, uh, for these people to basically praise him as a deity, they have created this, this religious or cultural edifice uh, that now gives the story more force, right? At the beginning of the story, Aku comes along, he enslaves a bunch of people, but these people know what it's like to grow up in a world that doesn't have Aku as the top dog. And so they have some, some access to a culture or some access to a tradition that does not involve Aku. 
But here we see that Aku is now all encompassing. It's not just about the direct application of force. It's about the very um, mores of society, the very customs and cultural traditions of society that are now Aku. And so it's basically spread through the world like a virus. And this this goes back to the the imagery of um, the beginning montage of the episode of Samurai Jack, when Jack breathes and his breath takes the form of Aku. So now it's Aku has become this sort of living organism, this mm -hmm. this cultural organism. And so I think that's part of the narrative thrust of of why we get these these uh, villains now who grew up in the world of Aku. It, it makes it um, that much more prescient, that much more um, in your face, that much more you know, palpable to understand what that means. And for Jack, it has very serious psychological consequences. I mean, because like I said, he's on his Mad Max lone wolf type thing. And so he's in a world that's now completely overcome, that's completely overshadowed by Aku by Aku, and that has infected him like a virus to a certain extent. You know what, dude? And, and not, not that you think about it, because because now it's starting to, you know, uh, uh, kick kick up the old Samurai Jack nostalgia trip. Because, dude, now that I think about it, I, I have to retract something I said earlier. No. Not every character in that original series did grow up under Aku's reign. Because, hell, even the right. episode, you remember with the... Uh, the astronaut dogs, the alien dogs, like yeah. they even talk about when Aku took over. So right. yeah, see, that was the other thing too. It's like we still had characters in that original series who remember what the what life was like before Aku's reign. Which brings, which is going to bring me up to to uh, bring up the next uh, subject I want to talk about. And and it was the one thing, dude, before episode three even started, I immediately noticed why Jack was having as much trouble as he was. No comrades yet. We haven't seen any allies, with the exception of that wolf. Because I I made this comment before episode, like at the beginning of episode three, before the wolf showed up. But I'm like, man, Jack does not have any allies, and we haven't seen we haven't seen any, and we haven't heard him talk about any. So it's like, yeah, like he, like I mean, he's as isolated as he's ever been before. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I do, I do like. That the first ally we get for him in this series came um, came from nature, and I like that because because that is calling back to something that we've seen multiple times because we've seen Jack, you know, uh, sort of befriend a lot of like um, animals and aliens and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, but no, but the more you bring that up about yeah, because I'm I'm even thinking back to like my favorite Samurai Jack episode, uh, you know, with Jackie the Blade when he when he uh, joins that mob. And oh, they right, they're, yeah. yeah, and they're trying to uh, they're trying to steal the jewel of Neptune for Aku. Even then, they tell the story of how Aku tried to get it on his own, and right. he failed because the spirits there prevented him from getting it. So yeah, even that calls back to like, no, nah, these are characters who remember there was a time before Aku was almighty and all powerful. So yeah, that's that's a very good point. Something else, something else I wanted to bring up and. Uh, this is pretty much like the main focus that I want to do for my episode two discussion because episode two is when we finally get the, you know, the attack on Jack. Consider this too. In season one, it seemed, I mean, uh, in, in the first series, in the first four seasons, it seems like for the most part, like I mentioned before, we were dealing with hired, uh, pre pre pretty much hired uh, thugs, hired right. muscle to take care of Jack. Whatever their, you know, um, predisposed specialty was okay yeah you know you're you're the best gunslinger in 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 the world i want you to take out the samurai you know oh you know i uh you're you you know your uh your missiles they never miss i want you to take out the samurai this is the first group i think though that we've seen from birth this is your adversary right this is who he is and you have to be better than him. He, this is what he does. Martial arts, swordsmanship, uh, archery. This, and you, you have to be better than him at each and every one of these things. So these are probably, the Daughters of Aku are probably the first antagonist that we've seen 
from Jump Street. They have been designed to be Jack. Right, and, and another element of this is that the this was not started by Aku. No. It's like, it's not like Aku said, uh, here are my daughters, I'm gonna raise you to kill Jack. These were some other people who grew up in that world, who worship Aku as some sort of deity, and who took it upon themselves to say, okay, we gotta kill Samurai Jack, because this is, this is what the god Aku wants. Right, and 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 that that just calls back to sort of that uh that uh fanaticism. I, I think I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Um, but uh, that sort of cult of personality that Aku has now um gained. You know that like now he has agents acting on their own accord on his behalf without even his say so. So uh, yeah, that that that's right. And another thing I wanted to to mention when you mentioned um. Jack's uh, allies or comrades. Uh, I'm just thinking, if 50 years have passed, anybody who Jack knew when we originally watched the series must, I mean, is probably dead now. Well, I, I will say this. Uh, minor spoiler, Did this, this was uh, mentioned offhandedly in one of the interviews, but the creator did uh, tease that the Scotsman would make an appearance in the series. Yeah, I did, I did hear about that, but he's got to be like what ninety. <laughs> and look, we don't do. We don't even know. It could be a flashback. That's possible. It could, it could possible. be a flashback. So who knows? Um, hell, man, who knows? Maybe Jack was with him. Like, like, let's say if he's not around, who knows? Jack might have been with him when he went down. We we don't know. To what right, degree the Scotsman would return? I hope it's the old Scotsman, though. Dude, I would love to see the old grouchy man Scotsman. Dude, that would be that would be awesome. That would be so awesome, dude. I would love that. And, and of course, his wife. Dude, expect. Dude, consider this. Especially if the entire episode he is like angry and like complaining and like you still got your youth. You can still jump like that. You can still move like that. It's like, man, I got to take this pill for my uh, calcium deposits. I got to take this one for my knees, this one for my back, this one for my arthritis. It's like, and he got a cane, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And he still got his machine gun leg. Like, <laughs> dude, that would be so awesome, bro. I would love to see that. Oh, my God, I'd love to see that. So finally, uh, the last thing I want to touch upon with, with our Samurai Jack uh, episode reviews, pretty much. I want to close out on where we leave where we leave Jack at the at the end of episode three because uh, episode three picks yeah. up where episode two left off where Jack is pretty much wounded after the the battle in episode two and then like we said he meets up with the wolf who pretty much uh, kills with him because we because right. throughout episode two we see that wolf get into a a, a very violent and graphic encounter encounter of its own with uh what was it that it was fighting a like a, a giant lizard right yeah some sort of, Al yeah almost like a dragon and uh we we get you know both of these characters together and they're healing each other and then even that wolf protect towards you know about halfway into the uh, episode it's even protecting jack as he continues healing and whatnot but what i want to touch upon is the place that jack arrives at where he finally, you know, he he's going back over that fight. He's thinking about that encounter. And then he finally says, you know what? No, it's okay. Or or at least I, I can accept what it is I have to do, being able to take these people's lives for what my greater purpose is. And right. how Jack got to that, I, I, I want to touch on. Right. Well, like like I said in uh, my episode review, um, well, f well, first of all, like I always say, um, fights and narratives, conflicts and narratives are never about just the physical confrontations. They're always about the deeper ideological conflicts that the narrative raises. And once you get to the point, and this applies in both fiction and in real life, once you get to the point where you have to physically fight someone 
because of differences in your beliefs, then you have to be prepared for the moral consequences of those actions. And you have to be prepared to deal with whatever the logical consequences of that action might be, whether it results in your death or in the death of the other person. And so when you have a person like Jack, who's in a situation where people are trying to kill him, you can't, you know, shirk your responsibility to follow through with what those consequences will be. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, if you're in a life or death situation, you have to not just follow through narratively with what the consequences might be, but also from a moral standpoint of what those consequences might be. And I think that was illustrated perfectly uh, in Jack's flashback to his father, yeah. uh, where he says, you know, once you get to that point where you have to kill somebody, you have to be prepared to follow through with your beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, uh, that was very powerful. Um, and I know you said that you were reticent, um, to see, you know, the, 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 maybe the, the dark direction that this was going in and maybe you thought that the violence might be gratuitous. Uh, but the, the, the violence of the situation is perfectly appropriate right. um, to the, the moral gravity of the situation, I think. Yeah. And, 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 th and that's, once again, that's another credit I have to give the show because it goes back to that original comment, how it is more mature, but it's not just mature because of what we're seeing. It's also being, t I mean, what we're seeing in terms of the violence, but even, I mean, the narrative from every standpoint is more mature. And it right. makes sense because we're dealing with an older Jack. We're dealing with an older Jack. We're dealing with a more desolate, world we're dealing with a more hopeless uh situation i mean we've never seen jack like this you know uh I, I, like i was i was talking with a friend of mine um you know about the city like i was i was talking with a friend of mine who who wasn't very um uh knowledgeable on samurai jack and i was telling her i'm like uh you know because she was asking like what's the big deal about the sword and I told her, because we're both fans yeah. of the movie Pootie Tang, I'm like, think of Jack as Pootie Tang with his belt. Like, Jack, didn't matter what he was up against, he could kick anybody's ass with that sword. Just like how Pootie can kick anybody's ass with that belt. Him being without that for this long, I mean... Right. It, it it it's broken him, you know, and we and we discussed, you know, the significance of that earlier in this review, but yeah, I think uh, I don't know, and it was kind of weird too, just watching that flashback because I'm like, wait a minute, this is something that Jack's already been exposed to. I mean, like even with that encounter uh, that he saw when his father, you know, defeated those bandits, like the blood splattered on his face, like right. Jack was exposed to this at a young age, so. Why is it that, you know, it was so startling to him, uh, you know, when, when he committed it himself? And I think, you know, like we said, he's, he's never been pushed to that. Right. He's never been pushed to that. And, uh, and, let's, and let's be honest about this. I think even if Jack didn't know that the Daughters of Aku were flesh and blood, I think if he knew that, he would have still tried to find a way not to kill them if he knew that up front when he first encountered them. Um, right. I, I think I think that after that that blow was struck, you know, like I said, it it was a full blown measure of accountability on Jack's part to be able right. to see that through, you know, because let's be real here. He probably could have kept running if he really tried. If he yeah, really tried. Uh, you know, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of uh, of a uh, Trigun, Vash the Stampede. Mm -hmm. uh, remember uh, when he when he has the gun, and uh, I forget the girl's name. I think is Merle. She tried to she tried to hold his gun and pull the trigger, and she couldn't. Right. Said, Damn, why is this trigger so hard to pull? And Vash was like, "Well, that's the weight of a human life. So anytime you pull that trigger, you better be prepared to understand fully what that weight means." Yeah. Abs abs absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh... Man, and, and like I said, you know, that once again, once again, that's, that's, uh, 
that is very that is such a samurai concept you know that uh even you know going back to the the samurai um as a people and as a culture you know uh even then like they did not i i i, th I think we do a lot of um uh, romanticizing of the samurai of course. um but you know killing for them you know even though your job is do what you're told serve that that's what you're supposed to do um even then though it's like that life you take it, there's still weight to it you know um Same when i was watching yeah i was about to i was about to bring that up dude because uh while i was watching that that third episode i kept thinking back to what uh shijuro hiko tells kenshin in samurai x trust and betrayal he was like you know when kenshin's arguing with him that yo we have to join you know the fight we have to you know join the war and he was like go there go down there brand yourself a murderer murder is the only art a swordsman can practice no ornamental words can change that you want to protect people with murder you'll slaughter legion so that a few may live he was like long before you were born my sword tore asunder the lives of men yes they were wicked but they were human beings first and foremost and i couldn't i couldn't help but remember that monologue watching that episode but like i said you know that sort of the weight that Jack now has, you know, on his shoulders. But let's be honest about this. He's always had that weight. Matter of fact, Jack's, and, and I'll, I'm, I'm not arguing whether or not Jack's in, you know, right or wrong for, you know, killing the daughters of Aku. I'm not arguing that whatsoever. What I'm saying is, I believe that Jack has arrived at that place and he's ready to move forward because the weight of those lives versus the weight of the lives of his people. Jack's been carrying that weight since the pilot. Right. So he, I think he is ready to accept that responsibility. It's just a matter of him realizing that himself. Right. And I think one of the things that this, the sort of narrative um, repositioning does is it, it really brings forth the tragic elements of the the story in a way that that was it was evident before, but it wasn't really as palpable. It wasn't really as visceral. Mm -hmm. And and I think part of part of the the monologue of Hiko Sejiro is that look, every time somebody dies, it's a tragedy. Uh, something something has gone wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. when, whenever violence is is necessary um, to protect someone, to protect yourself, to destroy wicked, to destroy evil, no matter what it is, but whenever violence comes into the picture, something tragic has happened. Yeah. And, and we, we need to appreciate that tragedy from a moral standpoint. Yep. Couldn't have said it better myself, man. Um, I mean, I could... I mean, I, I I could keep going, but 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 I I, I want to go ahead and I'm I'm just gonna hold off on that, you know, because uh, we we got a new Samurai Jack episode coming out tonight. Uh, so I mean, I'm gonna try to stay up and watch it. If not, I'll just you know DVR it, no biggie. Uh, but so with that being said, final thoughts on the first three episodes of Samurai Jack season five. Um, the the writing is just. Excellent, man. I mean, I, I I thought about this too. I mean, this. I mean, for, first of all, the fact that not just that they could bring a story back after fifteen years, but that they could bring a story back after fifteen years and have it age with its audience. Mm, yeah. I mean, that that was that was excellent, and and it re, it reminds me of all the failures of Legend of Korra because that story just didn't age with its audience. Yeah. Uh, but but the way they've brought Samurai Jack back, I mean, it's I mean this this fifth season that we're looking at. I mean, if the if the writing uh, keeps up at the level that it's at, we could legitimately be talking about this as one of the best cartoons of all time. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I think it's uh well I mean 
many people consider that already just because you know it's emmy award winning and you know the accolades that it, the the previous seasons have earned but i think uh this i i, I think you know I think it's really stepped its game up for this final season, you know, and I think, uh, I think we are seeing, uh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't help but, but love it because we're, we're seeing, um, it, it, it feels, it feels like a novel series right. that we're finally getting to see the author finish. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and I mean, as crazy as, you know, television is, as crazy as that business is, to be able to see uh, a creator finish it out with his vision. And I mean, at this point, I mean, I don't, I don't think he has any restraints because, you know, with uh, being on Adult Swim, being at that, that, that the programming block that it's on at the time that it is, I mean, we're, we're not doing after school special anymore. You know, now right. we're free to tell this story, you know, as, as gritty as it needs to be. But uh, but once again, I think that's a credit to the material because it's not gritty and it's not dark for the sake of dark and gritty. It's dark and it's gritty because there's a story being told about that character and about his journey and about his progression and about his evolution. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm really excited to be seeing it. Me too.